Hello everyone, how are you all? It's very, very lovely to have you back for Wineless Live in March. So this is very exciting. I can't believe it's only the third wine tasting of the year, but our wines that we have this evening are two very, very special ones. So we will be drinking Val de Lobos, which is our Portuguese white wine of the month from our cool wines. And our red wine this month is Rouen from the Algeo family estate. So it's a little bit of a different one this evening. We have both of our winemakers joining us in the comments. So you can all comment below and say hello in the chats, which everyone is already. Hi everyone, lovely to see you all. And if you see Rui, who is our white wine producer, um, he'll also be in the comments saying hello. And Gagana is our winemaker for our red wine this month so she will also be in the comments so you can ask them any questions they'll all be in there but oh this is wonderful we have all our all our usual favorite people hi fiona hi emily hi Anne. hi hannah lovely to see you all i know i'm sort of looking downwards at the screen this time but luckily i have very good eyesight so i will be able to read your comments so Shall we get started? Welcome to all of those who have joined us many, many times before and welcome to everyone who's brand new as well. So Wineless Live is basically about us just trying our cool wines, drinking them, going through our tasting cards and just having lots of wine on a Wednesday because that's exactly what we want to do when it's really cold outside. So what we'll be doing is we'll taste the white wine, we'll chat about it, we'll break it down, you can ask loads of questions and then we'll, Rui's saying hi in the comments, it's Rui Candido, hi Rui, <laughs> and Gagana's there, <laughs> this is so lovely. Uh, so we'll go through our white wine, then we'll go through our red wine and you can ask lots of questions, we'll drink lots, I hope you're eating lots too. So if you've got lots of food at home, take pictures and share it. I did see someone's Instagram and I put that this white wine in the tasting card. I put that it goes really well with cheeses. So they really took it with them um, and had a really nice plate of goat's cheese actually. It looked absolutely fantastic. Very, very jealous of that. So share your photos because I love seeing them because I'm really, really nosy. <laughs> and I just like sharing them. Hi everyone, hi Max, hi Stuart, hi Lex, lovely to see you all, hi Denise. So shall we get started? If anyone is new, don't worry, we will go over the basics as well so you know exactly what you're doing, you won't be missing out on anything at all and you can ask me any, any questions, so no problem. So what we're going to do, we're going to pour our wines out, that's exactly what we want to do. So we have Val de Lobos. Lobos is the Spanish word for wolf. It's the Spanish word and Portuguese word, actually. Um, that's not from my the short bit of Spanish I did at school. I don't remember it from them. So the wolves in the front, they're absolutely wonderful in gold. And this one is a reserva. It's a 2018 wine, so it's, it's got about three years of age into it already, which is wonderful. I like how everyone's saying hi to Rui and Gagana in the comments. That's really lovely. <laughs> so... What we're going to do is we'll pour our wine out and as those of you who've been before, as you all know, when we pour our wine out we're going to pour it to the widest point in the glass. When we have wine in a bar we want it all the way to the top because we don't like standing up to get more. But we're having a very, very civilised at home tasting so you can pour it to the widest point and it's going to help us taste more of the wine. So. It's got the biggest surface area, all those aromas are drifting up, and when you put your nose to the glass, oh, I love my first smell of the evening. Ooh, wonderful. <laughs> so you can already smell loads of it. And what you want to do with this wine, so Rue recommends that you drink this wine at eight degrees. And our fridges are only sort of zero to five degrees. They're very, very cold, which is great for vegetables, but not so great for our wines. So eight degrees is already quite a bit warmer. So what we're gonna do, if your wine is feeling very, very chilly, you can warm it up in the palm of your hand just like this. So take the chill off it a little bit. Mine has already been out of the fridge for a while, so it's getting a little bit too warm maybe, but it would never be too warm. It's still delicious. Um, I like that Rue and Gagana are saying hi to each other. Um, Tim, yes, so we always, mm, I'm gonna say always, yes, we always have our white before our red. The reason why we usually start with white is because it's better to start with a lighter style of wine and then move up in sort of flavour. So my background was always as a sommelier in fine dining restaurants and 
when you have a tasting menu and you have lots of glasses for wine paired with each one, the theory goes behind it that you want to start with the lightest style one and gradually build up. Because if you go in for a big heavy one, um, the next wine that you have, if it's a delicate wine, just isn't going to feel quite the same. You're not going to taste as much. You want your palate to gradually increase rather than decrease because then you won't get as much enjoyment out of it. So we'll start smaller and go big. Um, and it also means that you don't have to change your glass. So you can use exactly the same glassware. There's no washing up involved then, just one glass. So Jamie and Diana, oh, wonderful. And Tanita says, um, this wine smells like holidays in the sun. Exactly, exactly that. So we've got our wine poured out, we've warmed it up, we can swill it around. Cause it's the white wine, we'll just go for it and really swill it, practice it with this one. You can do it like holding, put it on the surface, hold it like a pen and then draw circles with that and it's going to start to swill it around. You can be a professional swiller. Show me how good all your swills are. Look at that. Not quite that good. Out of practice. I need to drink more. So this wine, should I show you a little map of where it's from and where Rui lives basically? Very, very jealous Rui, especially at the moment because it's freezing over here. So this is our map of Portugal. And as you can see, there is Portugal. On the right hand side of it is Spain. And that little pink dot just on the bottom left is Lisbon. And this, so this area, so Quinta de Ribeira, is in Tejo region in uh, Portugal. And Tejo region is named after the river Tejo. So Tejo is not that far away from Lisbon, it's a stone's throw away. And Tejo as a wine region has been named after this river because the river has been such a vital part of the wine region. So there's, there's me again, <laughs> if you want the map again, let me know. So Tejo is a very, very historic wine region. It's been a wine region for centuries, a really long time. You can see, you can see how old the region is. There's lots of Roman fortifications, ancient, ancient buildings. It's a wonderful region for growing grapes because of that river. It's natural irrigation for those vineyards over the centuries. So it's absolutely perfect. Portugal is a Mediterranean climate. And what that means is we call it Mediterranean because when you look at the Mediterranean Sea, all those countries around the Mediterranean, even though Portugal's slightly on the side of it, have that Mediterranean climate. So it means they have wonderful long hot summers. Their winters are quite mild. It never gets too cold because they're moderated by the sea. When you have a continental climate, which is what we have a little bit more of in our next wine. Continental climate means that it's really, really hot and then really, really cold. There's huge temperature differences throughout the year and throughout the day, really. When you have a Mediterranean climate, it means that there's more subtle differences. It's like where we all live in the UK. Because we're completely surrounded by the sea, our weather is moderated, so it's never too hot or too cold. It's just sort of nicely in the middle, which is very, very good for grapes. It's wonderful. And it means they get lots and lots of sunshine in the Mediterranean, unlike us up here. Oh, I do sound bitter today, don't I? So I'll show you Rui. Sorry, Rui, this is a picture of you. He did send it to me, so it's okay. This is Rui. So this is his family and their vineyard is family owned. So it was started by their grandfather and he just made wine for himself really. It was never really that commercial. And then this is his dad on the left hand side, Jose. And he's a doctor, but he decided to sort of really take up this vineyard. He really enjoyed working on the vineyard in his spare time, basically, on the side of being a doctor. Um, so he really sort of built it up. And then Rui, and that's his sister Mariana in the middle there, they took this vineyard over in the early 2000s. So they've really been building it up, planting a lot more vines, really sort of making it bigger, making a lot more go on and making it big enough that they can ship wines over to us in the UK. So it's not just for them anymore. We can have some too, which is great. So I did ask which of those three has the biggest say inside winemaking. And you'll be very pleased to hear it is Mariana. She has the biggest say apparently inside making this wine. And I like this because it's International Women's Day the other day. So female winemakers, sorry Rui, well done Mariana, team girls. So this wine that we have, 
as you can see on your tasting card, we have all the information on the back. So if you've not seen the tasting card before, you've got loads of information here. You've got about the winemaker, you've got our first impressions, what we thought about it when we tasted it. Then you have your local food pairings and advanced learning trivia, Graven region. But we're gonna look at this side. So you have four different grape varieties going on inside here. You've got Sauvignon Blanc, which we all know very well. Sauvignon is one of those really, really well-known wines. I can't, everyone's had a Sauvignon. It's just really, really refreshing summer wine, usually high acidity, very aromatic, full of fruit flavors. Then we have Chardonnay. Chardonnay is a chameleon of a grape variety. Wherever you plant Chardonnay, dictates what it's going to taste like. So if you plant a Chardonnay, you can plant it anywhere in the world. It takes really, really well in every single country. So you can plant it in England and it does well. You can plant it in Australia where it's really hot and it does well. Chile, you can plant it in France, anywhere. And the further north you grow it, so the cooler climate it is, the more sort of crisp green apples, Granny Smiths. The further south you go, the richer the flavors become inside your Chardonnay. So as you go further south, it starts to become more sort of less green Granny Smith apple, more really ripe red apple. Further south, you start to get stone fruit flavors, which are things like peach, nectarine, apricot, anything with a stone inside. Further south, you get to start to get more tropical fruit flavors going on inside your wine. So you'll start to get a little bit of mango. Further south, maybe even banana. So basically, the warmer your climate is, the more tropical the fruit flavors are gonna be. So we're gonna take note of all of this because Portugal's quite hot. It's gonna be quite nice, rich, almost tropical fruit flavors in this wine. That's what we're looking for. Then the other grape varieties, so that's Sauvignon, Chardonnay. Then we've got Verdello. And Verdello is a Portuguese slash Spanish grape variety. You only really find it in those two countries. And it's a grape that makes really rich wines. It's great in a drought. So if you have very little rain one year, you can rely on your Vidello. It's gonna do really well, which happens quite often in hot countries, especially happens often in Portugal. In really hot summers, you can go for weeks and weeks without rain. So Vidello is really hard, it can survive that. Not only can it survive that, it can produce some wonderful flavors, almost like a leafiness, a slight spice to it as well. It's a really interesting, rich grape. Then, Rui did something really, really special with the last little grape variety that is added to this blend. So it is Gewürztraminer. And Gewürztraminer is a grape variety that's really famous in Alsace in northeast of France. And that's its home really, sort of northern Italy sometimes, but usually around that sort of area, maybe of South Germany. But here it's adding real interest. So Gewürztraminer always adds this spice to it, this fullness. It can sometimes add quite an aromatic flavor as well. So there's just a tiny little bit in there and they just, they did that because they wanted to experiment, make something with real interest rather than just a boring wine, they want it fun. So Hannah has asked if Videlho is the same as Videjo. Um, one's with a J, one's with an L. Um, no, different grape varieties. So Videjo is very confusing and Videlho has actually been confused with many different grape varieties that you find in Spain. They have to do some DNA analysis sometimes because they think two grape varieties are the same. They have thought so for hundred, hundreds of years and they find out it's different. Videjo and Videlho are completely different though. It's just very, quite similar names. But yeah, completely different grapes. So let's get tasting our wine. What we're gonna do, swill it round, have a smell, have a cheers. Cheers everyone, cling. Um, I hope you're having a lovely evening, there we go. So what we want to do is, um, the same way that you're swilling this wine around in your glass, you want to sort of swill it around in your mouth a little bit, just a dash, you don't have to go overboard. You don't have to do it in sort of like those ridiculous wine videos that you see where they're really going for it. You can do it in a subtle way. You wanna swill it around your mouth and you're coating all of your taste buds so all of your taste buds are really working. Um, oh, Rui just corrected me, I'm so sorry. I thought um, Videjo and Videlo were completely different. My mistake, they are the same. I'm so sorry about that. So this is where we have Rui here. It's 
Wonderful. So what we want to do is swirl this around your mouth and then coat your taste buds and inhale very quickly at the same time. It's much easier to try this with our white wine before we go into our red. The reason why we're doing this is coating our taste buds and then that inhalation of oxygen means that your olfactory centre in your brain, which is connected to your sort of taste buds and your nose, it's working much faster and much better so you can get more aromas out of it. So we'll do it now. Can you notice it? When you inhale it, it just helps you to process those flavours and aromas a little bit better. Oh, what a wonderful wine, Marie. So we're going to look at the colour of this wine. This is the first thing we always look at. And we look at the colour to start to give us clues about the wine. When you have quite a young light wine, it's going to be slightly, depends on grape, but usually quite lighter in colour. The more aged your wine is, the richer it usually becomes in colour for a white wine. Can be dependent on grape variety, but usually you can sort of see that ageing. You can have wines from the 1970s when they look like honey colour. So we're going to hold up our piece of paper and hold our wine glass at about 45 degree angle over it, just like this. And that means that we can compare the colour of our wine to exact bright white. Because if you have green walls like this, it makes your wine look a little bit green. This way you get an exact background. So this wine has a lovely warmness to it. It just has a little hint of colour inside it. It's definitely not rich and intense in colour. It's just a lovely bit of buttery gold straw colour. Very nice. Um, Nick and Jess really enjoyed my slurp. Thank you <laughs> very much. I did practice for that one with water though. So this one has a lovely golden colour to it, but it's definitely not medium yet. It's super, super light in colour still. So the next thing we'll cross out is tannin because white wines don't have any tannin. And we're going to do the acidity test, but for those who have done the acidity test before, we're going to do it slightly differently this week. So we're going to do it the opposite way around to what we usually do. We're going to count how many seconds it takes until we, our mouths stop watering. So if you all take a sip of wine, swallow it straight away, and then start counting how many seconds it takes until your mouth stops watering. If it's very, if it only waters a little bit and disappears, it means it's quite low acidity wine. The longer your mouth is watering for, the more acidity is inside your wine. So it can be affected on how much wine you've had already. Sometimes your mouth gets a bit used to acidity, especially when you've had a full glass already. And everyone is slightly different because we are all human and built differently and it means that our, our perception of acidity is slightly different. But I think we should all be in a similar boat here because my mouth is still watering. I think that's pretty high acidity. Not the highest, you can take it higher but that's got a really nice amount of acidity in it. So what we love about high acidity wines is they're really, really great food wines. With the food pairing with this, I had a big chat with Rui over Zoom and he was saying that strong cheeses will be really, really nice with this wine. And he's exactly right. When you, I've put on here goat's cheese. And the reason I've done that is a little bit of a twist on a classic flavour and wine pair, well food and wine pairing. So a classic pairing is usually when you have a traditional food that's usually made in a certain region and the traditional wine from that region always happens to go really well with it. It's because of centuries of people living in that region sort of tweaking each thing so that they match really well together so that they can really really enjoy that all the time, drink and eat at the same time, it's a perfect com combination. So what happens is one of the regions that I'm thinking of is basically Loire Valley in France. And Loire Valley is famous for goat's cheese and Loire Valley is almost also famous for Sancerre, which is Sauvignon, one of the grapes in this blend. And because Sancerre and goat's cheese are made in roughly the same area, if you have Sancerre with goat's cheese, they're a really perfect combination. Loire Valley goat's cheese especially, it's got this sort of wonderful creaminess and aged. So Fiona's already there, goat's cheese pizza, perfect. 
And what happens is goat's cheese is really high acidity when you think about it. Even though it's cheese and it's creamy, it's a really high acidity cheese and that's why it's got such a strong reaction to, from many people. This is a high acidity wine, so what we're doing with this food pairing is we're matching up those two high acidity things. They're doing the same thing and working really well together. We'll get onto another reason why it goes so well with goat's cheese in a moment. So, sweetness on this wine. I've already asked someone about sweetness on this wine who was going to attend this evening and it was really interesting what they said. But what do you think the sweetness on this wine is? It's a very scientific thing when we think about sweetness. So when we look at that scale that we have, the very sort of, the very lowest side of sweetness is dry. It's zero to 17 grams of sugar per litre of wine. So it's very scientific really, but that's a huge, huge bracket. Medium sweet is about 35 grams of sugar plus, and sweet is 120 grams of sugar per litre of wine, which is huge, it's enormous. Um, in comparison, Coca-Cola is about 100, so it's about the same bracket. Whereabouts do you think this one sits? Because I'm getting so much sort of aromatic flavours, it's really sort of lots of sweetness on it, but is it actually sugar present inside it? I'll let you have a think. But everyone is saying, yeah, everyone is saying six, eight seconds. Denise got 16 seconds on that acidity. That's a very long time. Um, but yeah, I think we can all agree. Quite high acidity wine, this one. Usually I say if it's 10 seconds or more, it's really, really high acidity. But I agree with everyone who's saying eight. I mean, Denise, maybe it's the food that you're having at the same time, which is just making your mouth water. Mine would be if I had goat's shoes in front of me. So Helen has got, she's hit the nail on the head basically, not sure if, the, if it's the fruit flavours that make it seem sweet or if it's actually sweet. So this one is, it's, it has a lot of fruit flavours inside it which is making us think it's sweet. What you can do, it's what a trick I sometimes like to do if I'm getting a bit confused with sweet wine. I know this sounds odd but take a sip of your wine and notice that smell notice the sweetness and as you're taking that sip your nose is actually inhaling the second before you're actually tasting the wine so it so your nose is basically processing what it's smelling inside your brain before your taste buds even taste the wine and your brain starts to make up a picture of what's going on in this wine in your head so what you can do is you can pinch your nose and have a sip of the wine see if that is slightly different now so don't let your nose confuse you think about that actual taste is it the sugar yeah everyone's saying that it's sort of it's feeling very sweet but absolutely as Rue said it's a dry wine and it's the tropical fruit character completely confusing especially with this wine but it's packed full of really really ripe fruit and that's why it's making us think it's sweet and I like how you said tropical fruit because that's sort of leading on to our point about Portugal is quite a hot region. It's going to have tropical fruits coming out of it. So the next one is body and I'm excited to talk about this one because body is how the wine feels on your palate. If it's light in body, it feels clean, it cuts through, it's more sort of like the same texture as water or skimmed milk if you've done this tasting before and I like to talk about glasses of milk. And the richer your wine gets, so the more, um, the higher body your wine becomes, the more it feels rich and round and full and it feels like full fat milk. That's how to know the difference between body inside wine. Where do you think this one sits? Because we've all sort of noticed there's a lot going on inside this wine and there's quite a lot of body going on inside this wine as well. So if you can, if it feels like water in your palate, it's light body, but can you notice that it's really sort of feeling like milk? It's getting quite creamy, this wine. It's got quite a full body to it. We're definitely not going all the way up that scale yet because you can take it even further with wines. We had a South African Chenin Blanc recently that was like drinking creme brulee, it was so full. So this one is probably about 60% of the way. It's yeah oh samuel says medium but you all struggle with this you've got it spot on samuel very well done um it has you can exa exactly that you can sort of feel that roundness to it as plump 
So this is another reason why it goes so well with goat's cheese, because you have that body. And this is why we recommend really strong foods with this wine, because when you have that body behind it, that wine has the body, you can take a much stronger flavour of food, so you can go for really strong cheeses here, really nicely full. So Tim has said it's light to him, and what this might be, because when I first got mine out of the fridge, it felt much lighter, and now it's warming up, you're feeling the texture come out more, so it's feeling fuller the warmer it gets really. Um, so warm it up in the palm of your hand a little bit, have a go, have another taste. Sorry, I keep making you take more sips and more sips, and I'll take you take one, make you take one more sip now, because we're going to do the finish on our wine. And the finish is how to measure quality of wine. So the longer that finish is, the better quality your wine is, and the better it's been looked after by Rui in the vineyard and in the winery. So take a sip of your wine, swallow it, and start counting how many seconds you can really taste that flavour for on your palate. If it's two seconds and then it disappears, it's not a great wine. If it's five seconds, it's getting nice, it's getting very good. Seven seconds is getting really good, and 10 seconds is amazing. It's a really, really long finish to a wine. So Emily has asked, um, will the temperature, oh, which temperature? Okay, so wines are meant to be, if you've got a white wine, it's meant to be between seven and 12 degrees. So between that seven and 12 degrees back bracket, that's where you're gonna feel what the body is like on the wine. Um, it's only when it's sort of less than seven degrees, which is when you may not notice the body on the wine as much. But as, as soon as you get to sort of that bracket, it'll be the same body in all of that bracket, really. Um, oh, Natasha and Joshua have said, an essence of honey, full bodied. <laughs> and Anne is saying, bad planning, uh, but having it with chicken, rogue and Josh. I think it would go really nicely with a chicken rogue and Josh because you have that full body, it's standing up to the flavours. You've got loads of tropical fruits, it's balancing out the spice, but maybe not so if it's too spicy because that might unbalance your wine. So Rui has said exactly, oh Rui, it's like we're co-presenting this, he said exactly what I was about to say next. And we're talking about why this wine has body, and it's exactly that. So it has sometime in French oak barrels. So that wooden barrel is adding a little bit of texture to the wine. And on top of that, it has batonnage on lees. So lees is the word, L-E-E-S. And it means the dead yeast particles, which sounds disgusting. But when you have wine, you have grape juice, which is sugar. You take yeast, which is a sort of a live bacteria, like when you make sourdough or beer. And the yeast eats up the sugar and creates alcohol. So as we know, if you wash something with alcohol, it kills off bacteria. So as the yeast creates alcohol, it's killing itself off in a way, and it starts to decompose inside the wine. It sounds bizarre, but it's a wonderful thing. And we give it a very fancy name called batonnage to make it a bit nicer. And it basically means you're just mixing up those dead yeast cells inside your wine to make your wine feel full and rounded and creamy in this one. So finish, everyone is saying seven, eight, nine to 10. Really, really long finish this wine. I said um, nine and I put a little woo next to it with an exclamation mark. That was how long this finish is. It's such a long finish to the wine. And it, it makes it a really good food wine because it's lasting for a long time. It's playing with the flavors and the food flavors at the same time. It's gonna be wonderful. Um, so Michael agrees with Anne that this would be great with a curry. <laughs> um, and Anne does recommend it with a curry. Okay, we've got a new curry pairing. This will be very, very nice. I'm going to try it. I'll let you know. Um, and Emily says caramel toffee with fresh vanilla pods. So this wine is aged inside. We're going to go more onto this when we talk about a red, but this wine is aged inside French oak. And when you age your wine inside French oak, it starts to give it some of those flavors such as vanilla, caramel, that sort of wonderful sweetness behind it. So we've got our finish, it's very nice and long, and we'll talk more about flavors now. So what flavors are you getting inside your wine? Have a look at your aroma wheels on here. You can have a look at the first one. We've already mentioned loads from the first one. I think everyone is agreeing. It's tropical, this wine. It's full of really, really ripe fruit. I mean, I've ticked nearly every single thing on here. 
pear, lemon, lime, peach. I'm gonna carry on to the tropical part as well. Apricot, nectarine, lychee, mango. Add in some more melon, dried mango. All of these flavors, just one fell sweep, all of them. It's packed full of flavor. And when we measure quality wines, so we measure one of the things, which is finish, how long your finish is. Another measure for a quality wine is depth of flavor. It's how many flavors you can taste inside the wine. If you can only just name sort of three, it usually means it's quite a simple wine. We're naming so many flavors inside this one that it's getting really good depth to it. So from the second circle, I'm not getting any of the complex flavors but I'm gonna add into this cream. And I feel like the creaminess in this wine is its complexity. It's taking it to a sort of extra, extra sort of interest. Actually, and vanilla as well, that's a complex flavor too. It's a really, really wonderful wine. It's nicely balanced though, because we have so much tropical fruit and so much cream, it's nicely balanced between the two. It's not like one is too over the top. You've got both of them at the same time, balancing each other out. Um, Hannah's adding honey again, I think, yeah, honey. Pineapple, mango, dried apricot. Dried apricot is definitely, yeah, it's a wonderful aroma. And it's one of those ones where it's getting more complex. It's not just apricots anymore, it's taking it a step further. So, what's everyone's verdict on this wine? I've got a very manic uh, smiley face that you can see. But like, oh, and there's my woo, woo. Uh, hugely manic smiley face. So, um, we talked about cheese going really well with this wine. And chocolate goes really well with this wine as well. So we've actually got, uh, we've got planned a lot of tastings over the next month. And one of the tastings we're doing is with Montezuma and it's with both of these wines and it's showing how these two wines are really, really good with chocolate. So I've paired this one with the dark chocolate. It was a very, very hard day in the office. Um, very enjoyable and it was, so surprising how well white wine goes with dark chocolate and the next red wine goes with white chocolate. So it's just before Easter. I can't wait. It's going to be very fun. You can buy tickets. I'll remind you at the end. Um, oh, everyone really likes it. Wonderful. Amazing. Rui, I'm so pleased that everyone likes your wine. This is so, so good. Um, we, Emily's asked if there's any more, if she can buy it more in London. We have some stocks left over, so if you want some surplus wine, I'll happily, I mean, I'll fight you for it. But yes, you can have some surplus. So Stuart said really, really smooth. Lex had this wine with chocolate and it was really nice. It was really good. And interestingly, I had two glasses of wines on the go when I had it with chocolate. Um, this one was wonderful, made the two even better. The other one, horrible. And when people say that wine doesn't go with chocolate, that's the wrong wine, yeah wasn't very fun. So I'm so glad everyone enjoyed that one. Shall we have our red wine? Yes, wonderful. So I'm going to very carefully swap my glasses over because I've got a beige carpet. Ooh, perfectly balanced. And here is our red wine. So Algeo, Algeo family estate. And this is a Bulgarian wine. This is a very special wine. So we'll start with, I'll show you whereabouts this wine is grown. And I have a little map of Bulgaria just here. So Bulgaria, as you can see, is surrounded by lots of countries. So you've got the Black Sea on the right hand side over there in the east, in the north, Romania, Serbia, North Macedonia, Greece, Turkey. So it's surrounded by countries. It's gonna be a much more continental climate than our last wine. So you can see Sofia, the, um, the capital city in Bulgaria, and then Algeo family estate is further south. So it's near the border with Greece. And what's really interesting about this region is it's really quite mountainous. I'll show you a picture. So this, this is Gagana on the, <laughs> this is Gagana on the picture in the vineyard. So Gagana is in our comments. Hello Gagana. And as you can see in the background, it's getting quite a mountainous region here. So I'll show you another picture. Absolutely beautiful, this vineyard. It's a really, really wonderful region. 
And because of the continental climate, it means that they have really cold, cold winters and then really hot summers. So you have to have a really hardy grape in order to survive that region. Tim's asked if you can have a sip now. Of course, should we just do a cheers? I'll let you sip. Cheers, this is just for Tim. Cheers, Tim, there you go. Wonderful. So this grape variety is called Rouen. And Rouen is a cross between two grape varieties. So what happened is that in this region, in the very south of Bulgaria, there's a very, very famous town called Melnik. Melnik is a very historical town. It's, if you Google it, it's got the most wonderful, beautiful buildings, incredible, incredible landscape. And it's one of the most famous towns in Bulgaria. It used to have a huge, huge population, that's why it's called town. But these days it's only got a population of about 300 people. They still call it a town, but it's the smallest town in Bulgaria. It's really famous because lots of historical events have happened there. And because it's very famous for its food and its wine. So people will travel there from far and wide for their food and wine, their restaurants. It's got a real foodie atmosphere around it. So in Melnik, it's not very far from Algeo family estate and Melnik is really nearby. And what happened is in this whole region, they had a grape variety. You can see it on this side in case you can't understand what I'm saying because it's a very difficult word to say, but it's Shiroka Melnishka Loza. And that was the famous grape variety in Melnik. It was really, really delicious. They absolutely loved it, but the only issue was it needed a long growing season. And we talked about this in our last tasting. You need a long growing season from spring all the way through to autumn for your grape to really ripen well. So what happened is you have spring frosts early in the year that can damage the grape if it ripens, if it buds too early. And late in the year, when it's the really important critical moment, the, if you have some cold autumn weather or lots of rain, it can completely ruin your harvest. So what people did is they crossbred grapes to try and improve this grape variety to shorten its growing season so it could just stick to these perfect little sections of summer and ripen really well. So they had a lot of practice with this and they eventually crossed it. They have a lot of crossings and what's exciting is there's a few different crossings and one of the crossings we have in our case box for next month. That one's called Melnik 55. This one that we have is called Rouen. It's basically this grape variety crossed with Cabernet Sauvignon. So you're gonna get a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon fullness, but with the lightness of Melnischka, I'm just gonna call it Melnischka from now on because Shiroka Melnischka Loza, I might, it's a very long word to say. Shiroka Melnischka Loza, we're gonna use the full one. And it's much, much lighter. It has a little bit of a Pinot Noir style to it. It's a wonderful light aromatic wine crossed with that heavy Cabernet Sauvignon. So it's the perfect sort of in between the two. And when you, when you cross the two, it's got the shorter growing season. It's doing really well in this climate. But in the recent sort of few decades, climate change has meant that they don't really need that really shortened growing season anymore. So in Bulgaria, their summers have felt much longer. Spring starts much earlier and autumn, you can be in sort of September, October and it's still feeling like summer. So they spent all this time crossing these grapes to create the perfect one in, about in the 60s, in 1964. And it turns out a few decades later, climate change has changed it so much that they can go back to it. But we love the grape variety ruin. So Gagana and her family have really sort of taken it up and grown it. It's a bit of an, a bit of a rare grape variety as well. So it's very interesting. Melnik 55 is the other crossing. And this one's interesting because it's called Melnik 55, named after Melnik. And it's called 55 because it was the 55th attempt of crossing two grape varieties to create it. 55 times. There's another one that's, I think it's in the hundreds after that. Lots of goes with it. So. Gagana and her family, again, 
It's been in the family for generations, this vineyard. So it was a lot of the work of her great grandfather. It was started in the late 1800s. And her grandfather, Georgie, was the main man behind it. He did so much work in the vineyard, really, really built it up to what it is today. And now it's in the hands of Gagana's father and Gagana. So there was always a competition, I love this story, but there's always a competition between Georgie, her grandfather, and Stoyan, her father, and they would split the harvest in two, both take two halves of the grapes, and they would both make their own wines and compete to see who could make the best wine. Very, very high comp competition, high stakes here. And one day, finally, after many, many years, Georgie, Gagana's grandfather, admitted defeat and said that Stoyan's wine was, for the first time in his life, better than his. And after that, he handed over the reins to Stoyan and Gagana, and they've taken over the winery now. So, shall we start tasting our wine? Yes. Ooh, okay. I think everyone's enjoying it. Wonderful. Um, so we'll start to break it down, and we'll look at our colour first again. So we want to look at how intense our colour is. And it's it's got a nice intensity what do you think about it it's definitely not light it's definitely not dark i think it's somewhere nicely in between maybe even a sort of a 30 percent of the way up from light because of the shirokamel nishka loza it has that lightness to it so even though it's crossed with cabernet sauvignon and you'd think it's this end of the scale it's still quite light the color behind this wine so quite light telling us a little bit about it tannins on this wine so someone's already said, said in the comments that the tannin is high when i first wrote on this i thought oh yeah really juicy very nice refreshing wine and suddenly this whole tannin overtook me and i thought wow my goodness wasn't expecting that because of that really wonderful light color behind the wine so tannin is coming from grape skin and the more you press your grapes into their skins the more you're going to extract colour, tannin and body. So it depends on your grape varieties but we're extracting a lot of tannin from this grape. Where do you think the tannin is on this one? How much is this drying your mouth out? So have a sip, swirl it around your mouth and have a think about it. If it feels really silky and easy drinking it means it's quite light in tannin. If it's really starting to dry your mouth out it's high in tannin and those are what make really good food wines i'm obsessed with food i keep bringing food up again it's a great food wine this one because you've got that wonderful high tannin if you have some salt in front of you now you can do the salt test which is where you get you have a sip of wine you put a tiny little bit of salt on your tongue and then have a second sip of wine and notice how different the wine feels so it'll soften out your tannin tannin and wine is a perfect perfect combination Jamie and Diana don't think tannins are too high. Stuart thinks lots of tannins um, and Denise is medium. I started low with this one and after several sips, I suddenly thought, oh, actually, this is really taking me by surprise. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure acidity and we're gonna see how much acidity is affecting tannin. Tannin is drying your mouth out, acidity is making your mouth water. So we're gonna see where those two levels are. What you're gonna do is take a sip of wine. We'll do it in the same way as the last one. Take a sip, swallow it, and count how many seconds your mouth is still watering for. How much acidity is really present inside your wine? Ignore the tannin behind it. Just think about how much your mouth is watering. To help you really focus on it, you can do it with your mouth open like this. And by having your mouth open, it means that you're really, really noticing the tannin then. Yeah. Everyone's saying, it's got a nice amount of tannin in this one. I've put 60% tannins in this one. So medium and a tiny bit, and a teeny tiny bit on the end. It's got a really, really nice tannin to it, which is so surprising because it looks so light in color. But because of that Cabernet Sauvignon, it's got that really great sort of parental genes, wonderful tannin. So acidity on this one, what is everyone getting? How many seconds is your mouth still watering for? If it's a really long time, it's gonna be really high tannin. A short time will just be less. Um, oh, Gagana's just put in the comments, actually. This is really nice. Um, they've just found out that Ruin, this wine was chosen among Bulgaria's top 50 best wines for 2020. 
How incredible is that? And I'm really, really happy. And what a wonderful thing to have. They found out, I think it was last week, which is really, really exciting. So very well done. So what's everyone's acidity levels like? With this one, my mouth is watering quite a lot. It's still watering from that very first sip we had, nearly. Um, Natasha and Joshua have tried it with the salt and noticed how much of a difference it is. That's why we love to have red wine with salty things. It ma they make each other basically. Um, and that's why you have it with cheeses, with steaks, with anything sort of covered in salt basically. So Lex is saying 40% tannin, 60% acidity. Okay, so acidity is higher. And Andrew's saying congratulations to Gogana as well. <laughs> medium high acidity yeah quite high acidity i've gone medium high acidity with this as well it's definitely not as high as the last one it's going in a little bit but it's making it feel really fresh it's balancing that wonderful surprising tannin out so what's the sweetness like on this wine because this wine has some oak aging you can smell some quite sweet smells going on inside it, but is the sugar actually present there? Have a swill around in your glass, breathe it in, inhale all the aromas and have a taste. Think about the sweetness on this wine. So we'll talk about, we'll talk about oak aging in a minute. We'll talk about that when we get onto our aromas. We'll, we'll, do our, we'll do our sweetness for now. But so what does everyone think with sweetness? I think this one is a lovely dry red wine again. Really, really lovely. Very, very elegant, but it feels rounded and subtle at the same time. Oh, Lily is saying absolutely delicious. I could not agree more. Definitely. Yeah, so Samuel's saying dry. Yeah, we all agree dry. Lovely dry wine, especially from the last one, which confused us. Now we know it's dry. What is the body like on this wine? So imagine again how the wine feels in your mouth. You can ignore everything else. It's just about that wine feel. So does it feel really clean, very light, cutting through like water? Or is it feeling a little bit fuller? Is it getting plumper and rounder? Where do you think this wine is? The two things, well, the two things that we're about to talk about are basically Bulgarian oak aging. So this wine has been aged inside oak, just like our last wine was aged inside French oak and it gave it that sort of texture and some flavors behind it. This one is aged inside an oak barrel again. What is really, really interesting is that whenever you talk about oak aging in the wine world, you just talk about American and French oak aging. So American and French oak add different things to wines. They both change the texture, they give it a more suppleness, they soften things out a little bit and fill it up. And they also add some flavours. So it does depend on how new your oak is. If it's brand new wood, it means it's gonna add loads of flavour. If it's old wood, it's not gonna add much flavour. It's getting older, it's less porous then. So the reason why we choose American and French. French oak is Quercus, Petrea, and that is the Latin name for the exact species of oak you find inside France. And they add flavors of vanilla, baking spices, a certain creaminess to it. When you have American oak, it's a different species of oak tree. So even though they're still oak trees, it's a very slightly different species and it changes the flavors. It's different to French oak. So you'll get more of a sort of coconutty caramel. If you think of those Riochas that you probably had, which are really aged, Rioja is in Spain and they tend to use American barrels. Um, so you often get Riochas with that sort of caramelly, coconutty flavor to it. So in Bulgaria, Interestingly, they have a lot of the same oak trees, this exact same species as France. We have a different one again in England, more similar than the American one, but Bulgaria and France have exactly the same species of oak tree. They both have two different species, but the main one is Quercus petraea. And it's doing the same thing. So what's really interesting is French oak trees are very expensive. You've got to sort of cut down a lot of French oak forests and oak forests take about a hundred years to regrow again they are 
able to regrow, which is good. It's better than many other things we have, but it takes a hundred years. So you can't just get all the oak from France. And what you'll find is when you look into where a barrel has come from, there's many more barrels that come from different countries. And Bulgaria is one of the really great countries for oak barrels. So King Zygmunt back in 1456, he was really ahead of his time because he made loads of very strict laws about forest, forests in Bulgaria and about deforestation. So he, he made lots of laws in order to protect the forest so that when people were chopping down trees, they were replanting them just as fast. So even though we're using a lot of Bulgarian oak, the forests in Bulgaria are actually gradually growing. I think they went from 21% coverage of the country to 27% in a few decades. So it's actually sort of amazing. It's incredible that you hear that because you so often hear that people are sort of chopping trees down and not replanting them. So this is perfect. And it's great for our wine because it's adding the same things that you get inside French oak. And that's exactly those flavors that we're mentioning. That sort of vanilla-y softness to it, very, very subtle. So it's aged inside this oak barrel for seven months. So it's making our body a little bit softer, more supple, a little bit fuller as well. And it's adding flavors. And that's why we noticed a little bit on the, on the nose when we're talking about sweetness. So let's talk about finish and then we'll add more flavors to this wine, what we're tasting from it. What finish have you got in this wine? How long can you really, really taste it for? Have a sip, count how many seconds you're tasting that flavor for on your palate. Ignore the tannin and the acidity going on inside there because there's a lot going on. Think of that, those flavors. When I did this one, which I'll do it again, just to check, just to make sure. Still going, still going. Um, oh, still going, that's a really, really long time. Helen's asked if this could be described as the Merlot of Bulgaria. Oh, I quite like that description. I mean, Merlot has such a bad reputation because it's, um, it sort of fell out of fashion. Um, but I think Merlot is still a wonderful wine. You can get rubbish ones out there, but you can get amazing Merlot out there as well. So I get what you mean with that sort of medium of everything, like a classic Merlot is. Um, yeah, but Gagana's saying, yeah, we get what you mean as well. Um, but yeah, Merlot is a little bit fuller. This one's just a tiny bit lighter, but they're all sort of around that medium, lovely point. So, Jamie and Diana have asked if French, American oak and French oak are oak species. Yes, so they are oak species and um, they're very, very similar. Um, and Bulgarian oak is the same species as French oak. So American and French, similar but different. English, more similar to the French but still a little bit different but Bulgarian is exactly the same and everyone on the finish is saying eight nine seconds yes wonderful I think eight seconds on this one as well really really lovely long finish to this wine really wonderful so and this leaves us with our aroma profile so what you're getting inside this wine we can start with the primary aromas that you get in a wine. So every single bottle of wine that you'll ever open will taste and smell of the flavors in the first circle. It'll taste of fruit, it'll smell of fruit. And usually with a red wine, it's more the things on the left hand side. So it's very sort of berry-like things. I've put cranberry on this one and blackcurrant. What is everyone else saying? You can, so we'll talk about the first circle and you can start to look at the second circle flavors as well. So when we're talking about the oak aging flavors, that's moving into a second circle. Not all wines have something from that second circle. A winemaker has to make the active choice to do something to their wines to achieve these flavors. It's getting complexity out of your wine. So our last wine had a complexity. This wine, I can already, I just wanna tell you, I can taste caramel inside this one. Um, Sam said cherry and violet. Ooh. Yeah, Barbara said cherry as well. Definite cherry. Really juicy, plump red cherries. 
wonderful cherry, very sweet cherries as well, really, really nice. So black currant, cherry, red currant as well, plum, says Lex, definitely. And what second circle flavours are you getting inside this wine? Have a big swirl around, breathe it in again. I get a little bit of, oh, blackberries, raspberry and vanilla, says Gagana. I get all of those. And I was about to say, a little bit of coffee on this. Like a, like a very, very soft amount of coffee, like um, very hazelnutty coffee. Really, really subtle. <laughs> Emily has said, is it completely crazy to say it smells like Christmas pudding and brandy? Not completely crazy. I see what you mean. <laughs> but yeah, it's all those lovely sort of really ripe fruits, red fruits, red berries, and that complexity. So exactly as Hannah is saying just now, cloves, which is what you find in a Christmas pudding, that sort of Christmas spice. And that Christmas baking spice is coming from the oak aging. When you have Quercus petrea, which is the, the species of oak you get inside Bulgaria and France. You get vanilla and baking spices. It's that clove, cinnamon, everything that you'd put inside a Christmas pudding. <laughs> um, prunes. Oh, Hannah's having it with venison. Wonderful. Um, hazelnut, coffee, smoked cinnamon. Raisins. Yeah, not be raisiny. I'd say more sort of fresh berries with that sort of vanilla on top. But yeah, it's quite raisiny, yeah. Pruny, definitely. This wine is gonna be a really, really good wine for also chocolate. It's a great dessert wine. It's not, I mean, when I say dessert wine, it's not a dessert wine, but because you're getting so many of those wonderful flavors, that sort of really juicy ripe berries, the plum, the raisins, and then a little bit of vanilla and baking spices, there's so much going on inside this wine, it's absolutely wonderful. It's like having this wine, is like having a dessert almost, full and full of flavour. But re again, really nicely balanced between the two. If you had all the spices with none of the fruit, it'd feel very overpowering. But we have so much fruit in this wine that you can have all those wonderful spices and vanilla as well. Uh, Jamie's put peppery tobacco. I'm getting the pepper, less so than tobacco. If this wine was aged longer usually an older wine is more tobacco but this one's definitely sort of a bit black pepper um gagana says it is possible to pair it with a wide variety of foods and i think that's spot on so the venison will be absolutely perfect because we did that salt test earlier anything with salt inside it will be so nice and the tannins with this wine it will really sort of balance it out and um, so hannah's asked val de lobos could that be a dessert wine too so when I say dessert wine, dessert wines are the, when they're really sort of sweet and like 120 grams of sugar. But um, this is why I chose both of these wines for a chocolate pairing, because I thought Easter is coming up at the end of the month and these taste really nice with wine. So they'll both be really nice, really nice with chocolate. So it will be really nice with chocolate. And that's what I love when you can have a wine that can go with so many different foods. You can sort of have it all the way through an evening for start and main course and dessert and way on into very, very late at night. Um, it's so much better than those wines that only sort of go with one very particular meal and then you have to stop drinking it the second you put your fork down. But there we go. So which was everyone's favorite wine of this evening? Mine was, I mean, I put, I'm trying to see which has the bigger man, a bigger manic smiley face. This one is also quite a manic smiley face as was the last one. I don't think I can choose a favourite between the two because I absolutely loved them. They were so, so wonderful. Um, and we have quite a few tastings coming up. So feel free to log on and have a look at our tastings coming up. There is one this Saturday. It's a Bordeaux tasting. So we have a wonderful, well, two wonderful Bordeaux wines. So I think tonight is the last night that you can buy a ticket for that. So you can buy a ticket up until 1pm tomorrow and then that's our cutoff. There are a few places left. But as I said, we'll have a chocolate pairing at the end of this month with these two wines, which I'm really excited about with Montezuma chocolate, which are amazing. And um, we also have a dinner party evening, which is where you get a very nice bottle of wine and a bottle of cognac and a lovely recipe to do, which I had for dinner last night and it was wonderful. 
Um, so we're just going to talk about lots of sort of food pairings, the whole theory behind how to pair wine with food and also have some food with your wine. Um, and oh, everyone's saying, oh, okay, lots of, okay, lots of people saying both are your favourite. A few people saying Ruin is the favourite. Wonderful. That's very exciting. I'm saying both my favourite as well. You can say both are your favourite, that's fine. Two very different wines. Um, so Andrew's asked where are the events on the website? There's a little link in the comments just there, thank you very much. And <laughs> Wonderful, I'm so glad everyone enjoyed it. That's really, really lovely. And Helen loved the white wine as well. Wonderful, because it's such an unexpected wine. I'm really, really glad that you enjoyed the wines this evening, but thank you so much, a huge thank you for Rui and Gagana for coming along, because Gagana in Bulgaria, it's three hours ahead there, it's very, very late at night at her, for her, so thank you ever so much to both of you for coming, it's been really, really interesting and so useful to have you as well. Um, I can't wait to drink all of the rest of these bottles of wine, because they're wonderful. Um, but yeah, do have a look at our tastings coming up and I will see you in our next tasting, which will be in April. Um, they're going to be very exciting wines, so I'm really, really looking forward to it again. But thank you so much to everyone who joined us. I do hope you enjoyed it and I hope I see you again soon. Don't forget to have a glass of water before you go to bed tonight. Bye everyone!